Next, please welcome to the stage Dr. Abe Bajili of the University of New Haven. He conducts cybersecurity. <laughs> he conducts cybersecurity and Excel research, and he is hacking our devices probably as we speak here. <laughs> Dr. Bajili has been advising XRSI as long as XRSI has been around. The word is that he actually came up with a name itself. <laughs> Dr. Bajili has a IEEE paper about turning a person into a human joystick. Tell us, Dr. Bajili, is this new equipment attack proof? Probably not. <laughs> Should I get started? All right. Well, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I really want to thank Kavya and her team for, for uh, hosting us here. This is uh, the first time I've uh, been out since COVID, so let's have a round of applause for that. As you can see around the room, people care a lot about cybersecurity. Um, that was me being a little funny. Um, I just want to acknowledge my students that have worked with me uh, in doing research in this area. And it's very important that they get the acknowledgement that they deserve uh, for that. So, you know, I'm only presenting a recent or, or like one of the thrusts that we do in, in my center. Um, there's videos and experiments that you can find on our website. So if you go to YouTube and you go to UNHC FRAG, you'll find the videos of the experiments that I'm going to talk about today. And past work spans a lot of different things, uh, including child sexual abuse material investigations, which is very similar to the topic that we talked about before. But this work would not be possible without the National Science Foundation and the support of the National Science Foundation. So it's very important to acknowledge that. But, you know, any opinions, findings, and conclusions or recommendations expressed in this material is <laughs> of my own. So what's the motivation? And it's probably higher than that. VR is going to get bigger. Um, we started doing this work, uh, I don't know, like six years ago um, because I thought, hey, you know what? There's going to be a big security problem in virtual reality and augmented reality. The government's starting to spend money on this. Uh, people are talking about, you know, how big it's going to be. Um, HoloLens contract for the U.S. Army, 480 million. So let's fix the problem before it's, it gets bigger. So as you know, these things could be used for good things and they could be used for bad things. And we just have to acknowledge that. Um, and that's life, right? It's a double-edged sword. So what we did was we looked at immersive VR and we created the educational modules, some novel attacks, some tools, forensic artifacts, peer-reviewed pubs. And the idea was to generate some impact. And we did, right? So this is a new story about all the work that we did that was all over. Um, the world in so many different ways, um, and uh, we can't hear the sound for it, but that's okay. And most of you know the old systems, which is what we use to conduct our research, so I don't want to go through this, but technically there's uh, you know, an HMD, some trackers, and a chaperone, right? Um, a lot of my ideas come to me um, when I'm you know, just walking around, maybe taking a shower sometime, <laughs> and in this specific case, I was taking a shower, and I'm like, what if we destroy the chaperone? What happens to people, right? Will they crash into a wall? And we'll talk about this in a second. Now, you know, the systems are inside out tracking. So things are getting smaller. That's great. Doesn't mean the attacks don't go away. So we started off by looking at the security and forensic analysis of big screen and Steam VR. And we explored the stuff that you can see on the disk, the RAM, and the network. Now, if you think about it, what's digital forensics? It's the extraction of digital evidence in a legally and scientifically sound manner. So you have your cell phone, you deleted the message, you give it to me, I'll recover it, right? Um, you give me your hard drive, you deleted something off of it, I'll recover it. That's really what digital forensics is. We also look at RAM because nowadays most malware resides in memory only and that's causing a lot of issues. So we published this paper and we actually presented this in California and we were the first to look at these social environments and the type of artifacts they produce that can help us recreate what happened so that we can prove whether something happened or something didn't happen. So we were the first people to do this, which is pretty cool. We, this was their experimental setup. We had an Oculus Rift and HTC Vive. They were connected over the network. I should take this off. Somebody should have told me this. And we looked at it, the disk in the NetFlow. Um, these are just some of the artifacts we found, right? So, um, we can tell the manufacturer details, we can fit, tell the collision and play area bounds, we could tell the Steam ID. There's so much stuff that we could tell, which is great. Um, we can go down to Steam as well, because a lot of people, 
Uh, Steam is our metaverse right now, right? You go to Steam so you can launch things. Um, and, and that's really the idea here is like, if, we, if you want to show that somebody launched something, when did they launch it? When did they download it? When did they interact with the system? When did they log in? All of these things become important. We did the same thing with big screen. And we were able to know when people opened the application, when the room loaded, when the room was created, and all sorts of things like that. Rec room, same thing. Alt space, same thing. Facebook, well, sorry, meta spaces, same thing. And our overall findings is that, you know what, this is pretty cool, but we also found something else that's interesting. That a lot of this data is unencrypted, and this, once things are unencrypted, it's like close to my heart as, as a security practitioner. I'm like, whoa, what could we do with this? And this took us into another direction. So the next step of our process, so like since things are not encrypted and since there are some security holes that we found out through our forensic analysis, we're like, what can we do? All right. So by just simply looking at this screen, I'm gonna ask the audience a question. Where's the easiest way to attack a system? If you're like, hey, I'm gonna attack a system, what part of the system would you attack? The easiest way. Somebody, go for it. The application layer? Application layer, correct. But where in the application layer? All right, open VR. Why? Because it's open. When things are open, you can get to the source code, you can understand what it does, and then you can leverage that as an attacker so you could bypass certain mechanisms, okay? So again, we were the first people to coin certain attacks, like the immersive, uh, immersive attacks, chaperone attacks, overlay attacks, disorientation attacks, and so on and so forth. And the attack vector was quite simple. If I can get into your system, as a security practitioner, you know we can get into your system at some point using different mechanisms, then what can we do, right? So the first thing is, well, the system had a front-facing camera, right? What can we do? Well, now we could look inside your room, we could see inside your house, we can do all sorts of fun things. What about the chaperone? Can we take that away from you? Yes, and guess what? You'll crash into the wall. What about an overlay attack, right? Which is the new future of ransomware. All we wanna do is put stuff in front of our eyes. Well, what if I can block you? What if now you're so used to be, uh, driving when Google Maps is in front of you, and now I can just block, block it? And you know what, you're gonna have to pay me $20,000 for you to be able to see again into the metaverse that we're so excited about. And that's really what we did, and we showed that that's possible. Going back to the presentation before us, um, well, let, let's talk about this for a second. This is actually a software that one of my students wrote that streams in real time every single action that somebody's taking in that VR environment. So as an attacker now, not only can I see inside your room, but I can detect every single movement of your headset and your hands. That is a lot closer to your life than GPS. So the question is, is it possible? And the, question, the answer is yes, we showed that it's possible, right? So for people to talk about this hypothetically and to say, hey, you know what, it's great, let's talk about you know, the politics of us making this, uh, you know, bringing some money so that we can fix these things. And th the reality is these things are already possible in the current systems, okay? So please keep that in mind as we talk about the future of XR, not just in terms of us talking about what's potentially possible. These are possible right now. Here's another something, here's something that's really interesting. And I'm gonna ask you one thing, please, right? All right, and I wanna see how many people would take the command, just because it's fun, right? I wanna wake you all up. Can you please stand up? Just, I'd like everyone just to stand up for one second. All right, please sit down, all right? Most of you stood up, why? Because you, you were told to, right, exactly. We're human beings, we're extremely vulnerable. I just, I just indicated that when I tell you something, you do it. If you're in VR and I tell you to turn right, guess what you're gonna do, you're gonna turn right. If I'm a hacker and I just put a right arrow right in front of you, guess what you're gonna do? You're gonna be like, oh, why is there a right arrow here? So now I'm controlling you. But you know, it gets worse. What if I can change the center of the room that you're in? And I can modify the center of the room and then you'd have to adjust to that on your own as a human being, right? And this is exactly what we did. These are various VR games. At the bottom is what the user thought they did. And at the top is what they actually did. So by modifying the center of the room, the player kept compensating for it, thus moving from a single point that we wanted to move them to, to another point. Right? 
fantastic. And then you could see that most people were unaware that that actually happened. By the way, all of these papers have been published. You can go to Google Scholar, you can type our names, you can download them for free, and so on and so forth. All right? And then what can we do? We can get you sick, right? So it's fantastic that we can just put you in this VR. It's fantastic, it's amazing, it's great, now let's get you sick. Just by looking at this, you're getting sick, right? Imagine being in that VR system and now we're getting you sick as a, as a human being. So let's put this together, right? Let's compromise your system, let's look into your room, let's look to where exactly you're going, let's remove all the safety boundaries, let's move you wherever we want, let's block your vision and let's make you sick so you can fall down a stairway. And these are all the different attacks and if we put them together, they're more impactful. The interesting thing is about four years ago, I was talking about this at a conference and a lady came up to me afterwards, she's like, dude, like why are you talking about this? No one cares. And she was like, you know, in industry, we're not gonna use AR and XR. I was like, okay, let's talk in a couple of years. So the other thing is old attacks in new technologies. In this specific example, um, this, this is a uh, big screen before they fixed it. So we reached out to them, we did responsible disclosure, all of these various things. You can inject things in a, imagine you go into a room that everyone is joining into. If I have certain JavaScript code that I can inject, then it's gonna affect every single person that's connected. What can I do with that? Well, you can do a lot of things. You can do a man in the room attack, or I can join a room. Imagine you're with your wife or with your significant other, and now I'm in the room with you, but you don't know if I'm there. That's called, we call that man in the room. It's a play on the man in the middle attack. But I'm invisible. I'm listening to your conversation. I'm playing with your coffee mug, right? I'm doing all these things, so you don't know that I'm there. We also showed that you can actually develop an immersive worm and a botnet. So all of these things are possible. We also showed that there's a problem with Unity's open URL call. So with Unity, this, there's a call where if you pass it something like a calculator on Windows, it's gonna open it. How fantastic is that for an attacker? So now I've injected stuff into your, you know, now I have control over your entire system and I can launch programs, I can launch the command prompt, I can open up a folder, I can open up a file, I can do all sorts of fun things. There's a whole video of that, again, on our website if you wanna take a look at that. I don't wanna get into this technical stuff, but what can we do? Well, we can do all sorts of stuff. When we did that, we showed, at least with the original big screen, they've modified it, I wanna give them credit for that. But, you know, we can control, well, we, we basically created a botnet of every computer that's connected, we can control it. We can launch your microphone and listen to what you're doing, right? We can look at the screen that you're looking at on your computer. Those are just some examples of the things that we were able to do. All right? We can send you a message that's like, yo, you need to download this VR driver for you to be able to do this really cool thing. And it looks exactly like it's coming you know, from the program that you're in. And guess what you're gonna do? You're gonna download it. And now if I have this driver that's hooked into your operating system, I got full control for quite some time. Right, it's no longer just an attack that's happening in real time. It becomes per completely persistent onto your system. We can escalate privileges, we can do phishing, we can do all sorts of fun things, all right? But ultimately, the man in the room attack, to do that, we had to take a program, which is, in that specific case, was the big screen executable, we had to dis disassemble it. And then what we were able to do is stop everything in terms of me as an attacker sending my stream of who I am as a, an avatar, as a person, but, I, but download everything from all the other groups. Because if I can join your room, because we found a way to do that, then I'm just receiving what that room is giving me and I'm not sending where I'm at anywhere in the code, right? So these are the sort of things that become possible. Lastly, a lot of attacks are happening in memory. So if I capture the computer's RAM, what can I get out of that? And that's a very important thing in digital forensics in today's world. So we did some analysis, we ran the stuff, we captured memory, and then we looked at what we could do from it, right? And here's an actual volatility plugin uh, that we, you can run against a RAM, as against RAM output of a computer and you can see what we can do. So now it's scanning the memory dump. It found the VR monitor.exe, which is the process. It found the chaperone configuration file in memory. It found the controllers and the base stations. 
and boom, now we know exactly the location of where the device is at at that specific given point in time. We have educational modules that are freely available if you want to download them and play with our plugins for memory and all the cool stuff that we've done. Um, just let us know and go to our website and you can download them. We also have uh, developed the first uh, virtual reality experience with immersive VR education that's based out of Ireland where we actually tested the capability of us teaching in VR. I actually ran an entire class in virtual reality. It sucks, don't do it. Um, I just wanted that experience so I can come on stage and be like, I did it, it's not great, okay? So if there's a company here that does that, I'm very sorry, but we're not there yet in terms of the tech. However, you can do certain specific use cases. And in this case, we taught people how to document a crime scene and that was a really good experience in VR because it's so much easier to set up a crime scene in VR than it is to continuously create a crime scene on campus. So in conclusion, we need security by design. It's a landscape for novel attacks. There's a perfect way to control humans. Hint, hint. Cyber physical system components are very interesting. And what are the next steps, right? What are the next steps? So you have to keep in mind, we did all this research for $150,000. Okay? That's not a lot of money. How much money are we really spending in investigating the security of the future of XR? Ask yourself this question as a community, and it's a very important question we need to ask ourselves. Right? We're spending millions, if not billions, of dollars developing the tech, but we're spending close to 0% of the money trying to secure the tech. And that's a big problem that we have. These are our references, and thank you very much. Hi, it's a great talk. Um, the two questions I have is, um, have you given a lot of thought to how to manage identity at the edge uh, in all these different use cases? And the second question is, um, how, how might you also imagine giving users, especially naive users, back sort of control over their data so that they can actually perhaps choose where it goes, how much of themselves to reveal, for instance, in creating a realistic avatar, et cetera, and how much of their biometrics to give away? Um, I'm not an expert in those two specific domains, to be honest with you. Um, I can say, though, that identity is absolutely critical in terms of uh, where we're going to go in this field. Um, identity management, specifically, mm -hmm. right? And I think what's going to happen, and if I was to predict the future, I was saying the exact same thing yesterday, right? If you think about the two major companies in the world that manage identity, who are they? Well, Facebook, right? And what's the, sorry, Meta, and what's the other one? <laughs> and Google, right? Those are the two biggest companies that manage identity, right? So they have probably the best chances of them developing some platform that we call the metaverse, which I have a view on that I've talked about yesterday. The metaverse is nothing but an app store. That's all it is. And I can discuss that at a later time with all of you, and I can explain to you why I think that's the case. But if you have an app store, the metaverse right, is an app store for VR and AR and XR and all of these things, then what is it? Then what, where does that leave us? Right? It leaves us with a company that can manage your identity. We already have two of them that manage your online identity, and that's really, that's really your answer to that question right? in terms of how the, the integration is going to happen. Now, in terms of how much you want to show of yourself and changing your avatar and these things, I can't... I don't know enough about that because I'm going to have to, you know, whoever does this work is going to have to conduct enough scientific studies to show, like, what's acceptable to users and the different age groups and, and all of these things. I don't know if I helped answer just a little bit of what you were asking. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, I don't, I don't have a problem with the fact that you might not have an answer for all those things. Okay. For me, those are two of the biggest issues. I, I like the way you showed us um, all the different backdoors you could use to actually attack a system, because that was really, really complete and thorough. Um, I guess the only thing I'm saying is I think we're not thinking out of the box enough. And if you're saying that like Meta and Google are the only two sort of... Uh, that, that's not what I'm... That's uh, not what I'm saying. You're saying that they're going. They're no, going what I'm saying, what I'm saying is they're going to leverage their existing resources okay, and how they manage that. identity right, in right, order right. to do it to do it the same way. It's going to be an API that they already have for users to be able to leverage, you know, their I own think identity. There's like a home. lot of room here now for for creativity as we interact with this sort of new world. So that's the only thing I wanted to. 
Um, uh. I agree, uh, but I also think it's very important. Um, you know, here's a crazy idea for you. Again, I talked about this last night. I think one of the biggest problems we have is we have a we have an internet right now that's going to be the bad internet, and we're going to have to create the clean internet at some point. And guess what? The clean internet's going to be the clean internet's going to be. Uh, an internet that you log into with your own identity, your real identity, because anything that you do is going to be tracked. Right? We're going to get to that point in life, and I, we can have this discussion offline, in my opinion. But that's, that's going to be the way we're going to be managing our real identities, is by correlating the clean internet, I call it the clean internet, like with, with, your, own, like with your own real identity, right? which opens up a whole can of worms. But Yeah, let's talk about it. It'll be fun. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> I'm radical, I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, so first yeah. of all, thank you for making my talk that much more real because I was talking about <laughs> hypotheticals, you actually put them in reality. So first of all, thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, my question here is, look, a lot of the problems that you surfaced, we are suffering on the regular internet as well. So what are your recommendations on actually bridging that gap on like really stepping up security overall in the industry, whether it's AR, VR, but generally across tech, really stepping up the security game because this in the, in the metaverse is going to be a lot more impactful and a lot worse if we go into that world. Um, so that's a good question. I think there's two fundamental things here, right? Like one way is to leverage the existing ecosystem that we currently have and try to secure it as much as possible, right? And to do that, we need more, we need a much stronger cyber workforce, right? We need to start talking, uh, um, we need to go down to the ones and zeros. We need people that understand all the, like the entire stack of everything that we're doing and that go all the way to the lowest stack to really be able to secure the systems as much as possible. That's something I, I wholeheartedly believe in. Right? That's number one. Um, now, in order for us to potentially uh, change the game, we're going to have to do something like the clean internet. Right? Like that, that, like if we want to, like, there's two things here. Let's see, the existing system, we need more of a workforce that understands the entire stack as much as possible. Because realistically speaking, if you look at the entire cybersecurity workforce, probably only 5% understand that entire stack, and then the rest of it understand you know, policy, um, which is great. I'm not saying that we shouldn't, policy is not important. I'm just saying that that's really the reality of the cybersecurity workforce, right? Now, in terms of us, how do we move forward, then I think we need to do something radical. I don't know if that's crazy or not, but that's, how I, that's what I believe. Thanks. Last question, please. Howdy. Um, so uh, so uh, this was, absolutely love the talk. Wanted to uh, get your thoughts. Have, have you guys looked at doing anything uh, augmented reality related as well, or uh, kind of applications to enterprise? So, uh. so I will say uh, we played a little bit with the original HoloLens. Um, and one of the things that we were very interested in is this concept of shared spaces. If you have an AR system that's mapping your walls and your house, and I think that's where things get really in interesting. Right? So like, can I then uh, somehow tap into your, 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 your mapping and do all sorts of things? Right? Um, so like, uh, Ni like, I was really intrigued by the Niantic talk uh, you know, uh, in terms of them releasing their SDK. Because my, ma my mind went into like, oh, I can do all this cool hacking stuff now with it. Right? Uh, and and, and <laughs> so, so I'm just saying. Like, so I think, I think the whole idea of mapping. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you attended uh, the talk where, where, where they showed how you could use uh, essentially your phone to map out a space and all of these things, right? How do you authenticate that that's the real space? Like, it's just that, that simple question, right? What if we can fake it so that it's not the real thing? It's not the real mapping that you took, right? Like, and, but, you know, as, if we're crowdsourcing the, the, the mappings to people, like, how do we know that this crowdsourcing portion is being done, you know, authentically, right? So there's all these questions that come to mind, and I think with, with XR or augmented reality, technically speaking, I think one of the things that intrigue me the most is the weakness in the human being in terms of misinterpreting something, right? You're driving a car, tells you, go right, you know, you go right, guess what you're going to do? You're going to just drive off of a cliff. I'm, I'm one of those people, I'm not going to lie, like I go where Google tells me to go. Right, <laughs> so so I, I'm not saying you know I'm better than you. I'm in the exact same position. But I think to me that's that's the interesting component. So maybe it goes down to some UI elements, or it goes down to some other things that we need to reconsider. I don't know if that helped answer. No problem. All right, thank you. <laughs>